Good evening. There was anger on the streets of Dunedin today as more than 700 members of the public demonstrated their opposition to Otago Area Health Board cuts. And soon after that protest ended, the unions who will be most affected gathered together at the Regent's Theatre to decide what action they'll take. Sally Pears has the story. Otago Area Health Board Chairman Michael Cooper braved the crowd who gathered at midday to protest against the proposed closure of Queen Mary Maternity Hospital. But the marchers, adorned with placards, were unimpressed with his efforts to justify the board's decision. The march began with about 400 people, but steadily grew as it made its way along George Street. Many were people whose children were born at Queen Mary. I'm actually a member of staff as well, so I can see it from both points of view. I'm not very happy about it. Um, we're looking at having another child at the moment. And, uh, in January. In January, and we're sort of really quite upset about it all. I hope that it expresses something of what we feel. And I hope it's heard. I do, I hope it's heard. When the marchers stopped outside the Otago Area Health Board offices in Hanover Street, they numbered over 700. Michael Cooper and a few other board members listened to the march organiser Christine Bergen address the crowd. But we are really, really angry. Michael Cooper chose once again to come forward and speak to the marchers. We are going to ensure decent, good services are provided for mothers and children. But his words only stirred up the crowd. You can't do that in the main hospital. No way. Amidst the booze, Professor Cooper continued to defend the board's stance. We are in the business of providing good health care for the people we serve. And, I... and the crowd continued to push their point. That the people who are most powerless, and what has all this consultation brought about in tangible terms for people having their children in Dunedin? Nothing. Christine Bergen says she was pleased with the turnout and says public opposition is now known. The Area Health Board has been given these cuts by central government, but they are responsible for the way they carry them out. And just to announce to pregnant women that the place they're going to give birth in is going to be closed is absolutely a shocking way of making decisions. A few hours later at the Regent Theatre, the Combined Health Employees Committee pledged to stick together to fight the board. They condemned the government for cuts that have already taken place and asked that all proposed cuts be suspended. They condemned the Otago Area Health Board for not standing up to the government. They accused the board of mismanagement of available funds, describing the building of their new offices as frivolous. Union members were called on to let the government know there had been too many health cuts in the region. They were told staff and services have already been cut far too close to the bone. The meeting ended in a second march, opposing the cuts the board and the government are making to the health system. While the public and hospital staff were rallying to Queen Mary's support, board members today continued their talks on the cuts they'll have to make. They're faced with trimming 5.7% from next year's budget. Cathy Graham reports. Today, board members took up an invitation to visit Queen Mary themselves. They admitted they'd agonised over the decisions which will trim $11.5 million from the budget. Most of the cost-cutting proposals will come before the board again in a month. It's time. But there was no suggestion today it will pull back from closing Queen Mary. Clearly Queen Mary stands for a record of excellent and fine service and there's bound to be a great deal of attachment and sadness to any suggestion that it should no longer exist. But I believe that it is up to uh, management and the board and its advisers uh, to show, to demonstrate, that we can indeed provide good services we can continue to be proud of in the ward block or some other setting and at the same time release resources that can be used for surgical interventions. The decision to transfer intellectually handicapped patients from Cherry Farm back into the community has been approved in principle. The move will save the board $2.8 million and while it's proved controversial it does have support from professionals. As a full-time professional in the area of intellectual handicap I could not support any moves that I didn't see were actually going to provide a better service and a more appropriate service for the 1990s for people with intellectual handicaps. That proposal, along with many others, will be looked at again in a month's time. 
An improvement to shipping services between Otago and Australia was celebrated at Port Chalmers today. Local importers and exporters inspected the Trans-Tas trader, a new addition to the fleet working the Tasman. Mark Price reports. The oranges, the chocolates, the malt and canned foods from Australia were being offloaded this morning to make way for Otago meat, scarred wool and wool grease destined for Australia. It's the first visit to Port Chalmers of the Australian National Line's new vessel. There are now three ships on the same route, calling it all of New Zealand's main ports, as well as Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. ANL says putting an extra ship on the route is part of its corporate strategy. The demand was there for, for space across the Tasman, and they also felt that if they couldn't be successful in their own backyard on the, on the Tasman, then they really had no right to, to ship to other parts of the world. Locals say they're happy to take advantage of the new service, which means a shorter wait between visits of trans-Tasman ships. There'll be a ship here every two weeks. We've lost uh, three vessels in the last couple of years on the trans-Tasman uh, route, and this is only the third vessel now coming in between Port Chalmers and Australia. It has a very quick transit time of only about four days, so it is certainly going to benefit the fresh produce that has grown in central Otago's hinterland. And because Port Chalmers is the last New Zealand port of call before the ship returns to Australia, Otago produce loaded today should be in Melbourne on Tuesday. At a time when we're far more used to post offices closing, a new one has opened in Dunedin. Although the official opening isn't until tomorrow, New Zealand Post's new Moray Place office was doing business this afternoon. Sited on the ground floor of the new Gardner Motors building opposite the public library, the office accommodates all postal services, including private boxes. The St Kilda and Dunedin North Electrical Electoral offices are also there. The old Moray Place post office building on the corner of George Street has been taken over by Post Bank. One of the South's best-known painters has been putting the finishing touches to a major work that's likely to be seen by thousands of people every day. Peter Beadle's commission was to paint a New Zealand mountain landscape to hang in the prestigious Lloyd's of London gallery. The unmistakable lines of New Zealand's highest mountain have gradually taken shape in Peter Beadle's Invercargill studio over the past two months. His view of Glen Tanner Station nestling at the foot of Mount Cook was commissioned by an underwriting agency with New Zealand Connections to mark Lloyd's 300th anniversary. The $7,000 work captures the atmosphere of a high country muster and Peter Beadle believes it will provide good, positive publicity for this country. It's also an honour for him as the Art Committee of Lloyd's Public Gallery is most particular about what adorns its walls and Londoners can expect to see a lot more of Beadle's work. He'll have a full-scale exhibition there next year as part of New Zealand's sesquicentennial celebrations. And congratulations to Peter Beadle. We'll be back tomorrow. Good night.